Tamitam tam tam mi ajam prapadye Sanyanti avritam mitam tam mi ajam prapadye Yasya guna karma vidang banani Yasya vatara guna karma vidang banani Namani yesu vihame vivashakrananti Namani yesu Te naika janma shamalang sahasaiva hitva. Te naika janma shamalang tamajam prapadye. Yes, ya. Who's? Avatara. Incarnations. Guna, Guna, transcendental qualities, qualities. Karma, Karma, activities, activities. Vidam Banani, all mysterious, Namani, Namani. transcendental names, Ye, those, those. Asubhigame, while quitting this life, life. Vivasha, Automatically. automatically Renanti, Renanti. Invoke. invoke Te, Te. They. They Anaika, Anaika. Many. Many Janma, Janma. Births, births. Shamalam. Shamalam Accumulated sins, Accumulated sins. Sahasa. 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 Sahasa Immediately, immediately. Eva. Eva Certainly, certainly. Itva. Itva Giving up Sanyanti, Sanyanti. Obtain. obtain, Aparita, Aparita. Open. open, Amritam, Amritam. Immortality. Immortality, Tam, Tam. Him. Him, Ajam, Ajam. The, unborn. the Unborn, Prapadye, Prapadye. I take shelter. Translation and purport by Sila Prabhupada. Let me take shelter of the lotus feet of Him whose incarnations, qualities, and activities are mysterious imitations of worldly affairs. One who invokes his transcendental names, even unconsciously, at the time he quits this life, is certainly washed immediately of the sins of many, many births and attains him without fail. <coughs> Please repeat. <coughs> Let me take shelter, me take shelter. At, the lotus feet. at the lotus feet of him whose incarnations Qualities and, activities Qualities and activities are mysterious imitations, are mysterious imitations <coughs> of worldly affairs. Of worldly affairs. One, who invokes One who invokes his transcendental names, his transcendental names even, unconsciously, even unconsciously at the time he quits this life, he quits this life is certainly washed, is certainly washed immediately, immediately of the sins 
of many, many births and attains him without fail. <clears throat> the activities of the incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are a kind of imitation of the activities going on in the material world. He is just like an actor on a stage. An actor imitates the activities of a king on stage, although actually he is not the king. Similarly, when the Lord incarnates, he imitates parts with which he has nothing to do. In Bhagavad Gita 4.14, it is said that the Lord has nothing to do with the activities in which he is supposedly engaged. Na mang karmani limpanti, na me karma pales priha. The Lord is omnipotent. Simply by his will, he can perform anything and everything. When the Lord appeared as Lord Krishna, he played the part of the son of Yashoda and Nanda, and he lifted the Govardhan hill. Although lifting a hill is not his concern, he can lift millions of Govardhan hills by his simple desire. He does not need, it, need to lift it with his hand, but he imitates the ordinary living entity by this lifting, and at the same time he exhibits his supernatural power. Thus, his name is chanted as the lifter of Govardhan Hill, or Sri Govardhana Dhari. <laughs> Therefore, he acts in his incarnations, and his partiality to the devotees are all imitations only, just like the stage makeup of an expert dramatical player. He acts in that capacity. His acts in that capacity, however, are all omnipotent, and the remembrance of such activities of the incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is as powerful as the Lord himself. Ajamil remembered the holy name of the Lord, Narayan, by merely calling the name of his son, Narayan, and that gave him a complete opportunity to achieve the highest perfection of life. So there's many wonderful points here in this verse and purport. So this is Lord Brahma pray, praying to the Lord to be able to take shelter of his lotus feet. So <clears throat> uh, when we think, whom else should we take shelter of? Should we take shelter of the demigods and get some temporary benefit? Should we take shelter of our family, society, and love? Should we take shelter of our own mind and intelligence and senses? Now, these are all fallible soldiers. They're not, uh, they're not a safe shelter. But the Lord's lotus feet are completely the, the safest shelter in the material and spiritual worlds. So <clears throat> regarding that mystery, there are so many mysteries about Krishna. You know, when, you, when you think about it, if you, if you try to list the mysteries about Krishna, it just sort of goes on and on. It's a huge list. But um, for a start, he breathes out multitudes of universes. They're just coming out of his pores. You, can, you, you can't even sort of imagine this, that multitudes of universes are coming out of the pores of the Lord. And he's lying there in the causal ocean. And then at night time when he's sleeping, back they come. So that's something that we couldn't, we can't really sort of understand. And then Krishna is running all the affairs of the material universe, all the universe, the material world, and the spiritual world. At the same time, he's busy enjoying himself in Galoka with no cares. So this is this is very mysterious and very wonderful. So the Lord's glories are ever expanding, and the Lord Himself can't even understand the limits of his own glories because they keep increasing. So he's so mysterious that he can't get to the end of understanding those mysteries. And nobody can know the Lord. Even his first expansion, Lord Balaram, does not completely know the Lord. It's described when Krishna expanded in Vrindavan, he expanded to be all the cowherd boys uh, and all the calves then nobody knew that, and Lord Balaram didn't even know that. He, he had no idea. This went on for a whole year, and it was only at the end of the year when one, there was one incident when the cows came rushing down to the calves, and the cowherd men then came rushing down to the boys and started embracing them, that Lord Balaram said, what is this? 
that, that attraction to the cows, the calves and the boys are like their attraction to you. Have, have, are you these acting as these calves and cowherd boys? And then that was the time when the, you know, the whole um, revelation came uh, in, and to Lord Brahma. And indeed, Krishna was doing that, but Lord Balaram was unaware of that. So Krishna's activities are completely mysterious. And, um, you know, it's not in our power to try to uh, really understand those mysteries, but uh, simply to glorify him. So <clears throat> the Lord, when he takes on these incarnations, he's not actually working hard. For him it's a pleasure. Um, it doesn't matter if he's killing demons or all the different pastimes in all the different incarnations. Krishna is getting great pleasure from that. So when we see the pastimes, we might think, oh, you know, Lord Ram uh, has to go to the forest, he can't take up and be the king. And then at the end, when he's separated from Sita, it sort of breaks your heart to hear this. But for the Lord, it's all pleasure. He was loving going to the forest uh, and helping all those sages. And what, whatever he's doing in his different pastimes, it gives him great pleasure. Even Lord Varaha, when he picks up this, um, the unit, the whole of Bhumandala it is, he picks on, up on his tasks. So for him, he comes out of that wood, he goes all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, comes out with Bhumandala on his tasks. Imagine how huge and powerful he is. And he sets the planet gently there, and then he sets out to fight here in Yaksha. So this is all enjoyment for the Lord. And it's described here that he's like an actor in a stage play. He doesn't have to do those pastimes. But the nice thing is, out of compassion, he does come and he leaves us various remnants. So if you go to Vrindavan, you can find rocks that have melted due to Krishna, Krishna's love for Simati Radharani, and you can actually take the darshan of the imprint of Krishna's lotus feet. And there's so many um, pastime places you can visit when you go to Vrindavan that Krishna has left us out of his kindness. Similarly, when you go to Ayodhya, in so many different places, there are um, transcendental um, reminders of his pastimes for us. So this is all Krishna's compassion that he comes. Everything he touches during his pastimes, everywhere he goes, um, gets the touch of his transcendental feet is purified. So um, they may be human-like pastimes in the sense that he has living with a family, um, he, he performs the activities that a, a, a normal person would do, but Lord Krishna is completely transcendental at all times. So, <clears throat> for instance, he, he is um, within his family of um, uh, Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda. He played the part of the son, and um, you know, he would struggle along, put his father's slippers on his head and carry them to him when he was just so small. And you could say it's a struggle, but actually he's enjoying that pastime of serving his father. And um, with Mother Yasoda, there's so many wonderful pastimes uh, with Mother Yasoda and the elderly gopis, they're all clapping and getting Krishna to dance. So like a puppet, he's dancing for them and it's, it's giving them so much pleasure. But he's actually enjoying all of this all the pastimes of the cowherd boys with them, maybe fighting and wrestling. For the Lord, it's all supreme sport. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, it's, just, it's explained here that in 4.14, the Lord is not affected, it's stated, he's not affected by the activities of this material world. So he creates, and yet he remains aloof from the creation. So us, for us living entities, we are here because we've come to this material world to enjoy and have sense gratification. But for Krishna, Krishna never de desires low-grade happiness. His happiness is transcendental. But he's given us this facility because he wants that we reconnect with him. So all the facilities are there that he gives, but he's not attached to what's going on. <clears throat> So, nor is he responsible, you know, he, he's given everything and then it's up to the living entities to, um, 
through their particular karma and their particular desires, they exploit, and exploit the material energy. And then that reaction for that is theirs because the Lord's given them all possibility to do anything spiritual or material. It's up to them. And then they, <clears throat> they accordingly, we accordingly suffer or enjoy. So this is, this is his kindness. So it's described that the Lord is not partial, and yet we know there are so many beautiful verses about the partiality of the Lord. In fact, there's one verse where he said, I would lop off my arm for my devotee. So he is actually partial to the devotees. But the, the kindness is that he gives any, the impartiality is that he gives any of us the opportunity to be that devotee that he will protect by lopping off his arm. So, for example, he had so many demons in Vrindavan, they came, one after the other. Um, so, um, um, uh, sorry, Keshi came, and Agasura came, and so many came. So those demons were killed by Krishna. But you could think that that's Krishna being unkind, but they were immediately liberated. And Putana is often given, the example of Putana is often spoken about because when baby Krishna was three months, months old, he dispatched Putana. But she was actually sent to be his eternal nursemaid. Even though she had poison on her breast and her desire was to kill Krishna, her mentality was envious. But because she offered her breast milk, Krishna took that feature and instated her as his eternal nursemaid. So in that sense, he's impartial. But we also know that the way to, um, to have the Lord partial to anybody is to take up devotional service, because then he becomes personally involved and partial. So, <clears throat> so it's described here that it was not Krishna's concern to lift up Govardhan Hill, because he can move mountains just by a fraction of a thought. He doesn't actually have to lift up a mountain. But he took his left lotus hand and he picked up that mountain. It's described like a child picks up a mushroom. It was so easy. Or like an elephant picks up a lotus flower. It's so easy for him. Um, but the reason he performed that pastime was to give all his Vrindavan devotees his darshan 24-7. Because normally, in the evenings, he had to go to Mother Yasoda's house and all the cowherd boys were missing him, all the gopis were missing him. Everyone was thinking about Krishna, but they couldn't have his association. So, but when he um, took this pastime for seven days and seven nights, everybody was able to um, have darshan of the Lord's beautiful lotus feet and lotus face 24-7 for that whole week. So it's a very special pastime. And... Um, so we know that Govardhan Antari is especially merciful, and here he is, blessing us. So I wanted to read um, a little bit about that pastime of um, lifting Govardhan Hill, because it's a book called Ananda Vrindavan Champu, and it's by Shula Kavi Karnapuna, and uh, it was translated by Subhag Swami and um, Banu Swami. And it has, it's all about Krishna's pastimes, but it has like little extra information than the 12th canto, the 10th canto. So this is what Krishna says. When I lifted the hill, he, he's speaking to the inhabitants of Vrindavan, trying to entice them to come under Govardhan Hill because they were just struck with wonder. First of all, they'd been, uh, you know, uh, harassed by the heavy rain and the thunder and lightning. And uh, now Krishna is asking them, he's lifted this hill, he's asking them to come under. So he says, when I lifted the hill, huge chunks of earth fell off the bottom and formed a natural boundary wall around the perimeter of Giriraj. This will keep out the torrential rains. Forget about your pleasure gardens and your attachments to your former residences. Let this place become the source, source of joyful pastimes for the cows, gopas and gopis. The string of Govardhantari's reassuring words resembled an elegant necklace made from the nectar of his voice. 
Immediately, the elderly gopas felt completely pacified by Krishna's sweet words, taking their wealth, sons, wives, cows, and priests, who felt immeasurable happiness and beamed with matchless beauty. They entered the splendid valley beneath Giri Govardhan. Taking shelter there, they all filled they were all filled with surprise and smiled with delight. They clearly saw that the valley beneath Govardhan, which dazzled attractively in the light, could easily accommodate all their innumerable cows, animals, and family members. The valley brimmed with gratifying sense objects to see, touch, taste, and so on. That divine place was the very ornament of the earth. Its purity and opulence exceeded the wealth of the subterranean heavenly planets. Fields of rich green barley spread in all directions, and many lakes full of clear crystal water stood here and there. The cows stayed near the border of the improvised town and pastured on fields full of fresh green grass. The Rajavasis stood around peacefully in different groups. Some cowherd men mixed with the brahmanas, and the elderly ladies stayed with their daughters. Radhika and other prominent young married gopis gathered beside them. Krishna's intimate friends remained by his side, and Nanda, Yashoda, and Balaram stood slightly in front of him. Thus the venerable Rajavasis relished great joy, associating intimately with Krishna. They no longer felt any fear or discomfort from Indra's deluge, which threatened to destroy the whole world. The rain falling from the roaring clouds sounded like water pouring from the mouths of many large water pots. Although situated in different directions, all the Vrajavasis gazed to their heart's content at the gorgeous lotus face of Giridhari, the lifter of Govardhan Hill. Each devotee saw that Krishna was looking directly at him. You know, sometimes you go into an art gallery and people will say, you walk around this art gallery, the eyes of that person will follow you. So in this way, all the residents were looking at Krishna. Wherever they were, they saw Krishna's gaze at them. <laughs> Feeling relieved, the illustrious Brahmanas offered abundant blessings to the blissful younger brother of Balaram. Krishna descended on earth to perform his transcendental pastimes and to crush the pride of the demon and the demigods. While holding up Govardhan Hill, Krishna was surrounded by all his loving associates. Taking advantage of the intimate setting, they gazed at Krishna with joyful faces, prayed for his victory, or affectionately smelled his head. Being saturated with parental affection, Mother Rohini firmly embraced her son Balaram, who always gives immense pleasure to his parents. Both the submissive gopis and the contrary ones like Radhika smiled blissfully while looking at Krishna with love-laden glances. The gopis always play with Krishna and enjoy love sports in the forests of Vrindavan. While gazing upon him, they looked like thirsty chikori birds and continually and were continually drinking the ambrosial radiance of his moon-like face. With unblinking eyes, they took Krishna within their hearts and lovingly embraced him. During the festival of lifting Govardhan Hill, Everyone tasted the greatest ecstasy. So just that one pastime is so wonderful and it satisfied all those devotees of Vrindavan so nicely. So all of these pastimes are absolute because Krishna is the absolute truth. So just by remembering these uh, different incarnations or the, personal, on the, or the personal appearance of Krishna, then that in itself, those remembrances are transcendental and can return us to Goloka Vrindavan. And in this uh, verse, it's explained that um, even one who invokes his transcendental names, even unconsciously at the time he quits his life, is certainly washed of all sins and attains him without fail. So there's this story that we often hear about a Muslim who had a, it was in the forest, I believe he was performing his ablutions, and then suddenly this wild boar was rushing at him, and he called out, Ha Ram! Which means, how horrible. <laughs> but because he said Ram, he was liberated. And then Prabhupada also uh, 
um, mentions the story of, of um, Ajamil. So I wanted to tell you one thing that I was initiated with a devotee called Ajamil, and that was in 1972, and we didn't know anything about, to stick, uh, we just had the first three cantos, we didn't know anything about who Ajamil was. So <clears throat> this devotee was Arthur, he was a boxer and he was, you know, quite a <laughs> bit argumentative and everything. So Prabhupada called him up and he said, your name is Ajamil. Ajamil was a great sinner. And we just <laughs> didn't know anything. We just sort of burst out laughing because we thought, oh, the poor thing, he's got named a, the name of a great sinner. <laughs> but uh, then Prabhupada proceeded to explain uh, what happened with Ajamil. And then we could understand how he got that name. So Ajamil was born in a Brahmana family, and he was a very Paka Brahman, and he, his father raised him nicely. And um, he was performing all his puja. He would go to the forest every day and bring wood and all the things he needed for, um, to worship the Lord. And then one day, when he was passing, he saw a sudra, Sudrani, a Sudra woman, and a Sudra. And they were intoxicated, and they were kissing, and they were, you know, inappropriate. It was very inappropriate. Of course, at that time, we know the society was so strict. And um, but somehow or another, Ajamil became attracted, and um, you know, the whole the rest of his life was a story of this fall down. He, you know, he took on that Sudra woman, and um, they married. And you know, of course, he was then an outcast. He couldn't work normal work, so he became a a thief and a plunderer and took intoxication and all bad sinful things. So Ajamil lived a long life, uh, a long sinful life with this Sudrani and her children, their children, and um, they had named their youngest son Narayan. And um, <clears throat> when that son was just two or three years old, he used to, um, Ajamil used to really sort of he was, this was his pet son, and he would always call him Ajamil, come eat, Ajamil, take this. And he was very attached to Ajamil. So Prabhupada explains that uh, he, he was unaware that death was coming. So when the Yamadutas came to take that sinful soul, he was completely unexpected, uh, not expecting it, and out of fear, it's described he called out to Ajamil, to Nara, his son, out of fear, and he called Narayan. But it was a, a pure call in the sense that he wasn't thinking about anything else. You know, it was just done out of fear, and he called the name of Narayan. So the Yamadudas are busy snatching that heart, that soul from the heart, and then along came these gorgeous Vishnu Dudas, and they're like, stop, and they, you can't take him. And they, so this conversation ensues in the sixth canto. It's a, it's a fantastic um, Kind of inter exchange where the Yama Dudas, um, the Vishnu Dudas, uh, and the Yama Dudas explain what is re religiosity. The Yama Dudas have to explain to the Vishnu Dudas what is religiosity. So um, they're trying to explain, as they've been taught by Yamaraj, you know, what is religiosity. So they were coming to the conclusion that Ajamir should have been snatched because he was such a sinful man. But then the Vishnu Dudas started to explain about the holy name of Narayan. They didn't know who the Vishnu Buddhas were, but they were respectful to them because they were very beautiful and obviously, you know, transcendental. So when they explained um, that Ajamil had called out the holy name of their master and that therefore he was their property, um, then the Yamadudas were respectful. And uh, the, the, um, the Vishnu Dutas allowed Ajamil to remain in that body, but he had witnessed this incredible conversation. So his mind was totally blown, because first of all, he was terrified, he was dying, he was being snatched away, and the Yamadutas are very fierce. And then he sees these beautiful transcendental personalities come, and uh, he witnesses this conversation. So it totally um, turned him back to what he'd been doing at the beginning of his life, was. Um, to worshipping the Lord in a Brahminical way. And it's described he went to Hardwar, he performed many austerities there, and he actually um, was living on the bank of the Ganges, and a celestial golden airplane came for him at the time of death and returned him to the spiritual world. 
So that's his great fortune. But our great fortune is that we've been informed about the Holy Name. We've been given uh, the process to um, be fully engaged in that name and, and fully engaged in the Lord's service. So it's described that somebody who um, takes up the name of the Lord never even sees the Yamadudas, not even in dreams, they won't come. But for someone who's sinful, they will come. So, um, <clears throat> So this is, at first is advising us to um, contemplate these the variety of the Lord's different incarnations, and there are so many wonderful incarnations we can think about. It's so unusual too, like the the Hangsa incarnation. The Lord took the form of a, a beautiful swan, beautiful white swan, effulgent, and he was speaking to Lord Brahma's sons and to um, Lord Brahma and his sons, the, the Sanat Kumar, the four Kumaras, uh, answering questions that they had that Lord Brahma couldn't really answer. So the Hangsa incarnation came and evolved all that information to Lord Brahma and his sons. And, um, you know, we already mentioned the Varaha, the, the hog, incarnation of Hog, you know, in the material world, a Hog is so horrible. But Varaha is very beautiful. It's described sometimes that he has uh, like reddish hairs and in some incarnation, some incarnations white. Um, so therefore you'll get um, sometimes dark murtis or varaha, okay? or sometimes white. Um, in different uh, in, um, times, in different um, ages, he comes differently. Uh, Lord Nishringade with his remarkable uh, form which had never been seen of half man, half lion, but Krishna himself. Lord Ram's pastimes that melt the heart. If you know, you can get completely absorbed in these pastimes, and just by doing that, you're saved from repeated birth and death. And then, of course, you know, we have Lord Vamanadev who came as this sweet boy and then took over, took over the whole universe from Bali Maharaj. So, and our our Lord Chaitanya. Of course, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Krishna himself, you know, they're not exactly, they're not actually incarnations. They're the Lord himself. And, um, and but all, all of their pastimes are also superlatively wonderful. Uh, and um, devotees can, um, uh, when we go to visit them in, Maya, in Mayapur or Vrindavan, we can witness the various places where these pastimes, wonderful pastimes took place. So how do we remember Krishna's name at the time of death when everything, the life heirs are all disordered? Um, so you kind of have to have uh, so much practice that that holy name is on the tip of your tongue. So if we're feeling sad about things, then Hare Krishna, you've got to say that name, remember the name, and then we'll remember the Lord by remembering the name. Actually, Prabhupada described that even in the material world, if, you, if we are looking at something, say we're looking at a tree, and we, we then can remember that this tree is the energy of Krishna. So when the pure devotees, when they remember this tree is the energy of Krishna, then they see Krishna's form. So we see a tree and we understand this is Krishna's energy. But they see a tree and they see Oh, Krishna, as soon as they're, because they're remembering Krishna, they see Krishna. <laughs> so, but we can do the, at least we can remember that all these energies come from Krishna. And if we're having a difficult time, there's no real shelter. We can take shelter of the devotees and we can take shelter of the holy name. Because the devotees are our real family. And um, there, aren't, there isn't actually any other shelter. We may think there's another shelter, but <laughs> actually not. So, and if we're happy, Hare Krishna. There's that nice pastime in Chaitanya Charitamrita when they're washing the Gunditja temple. So on that day, everybody just uh, said Hare Krishna. So when they were asking for water, they'd say Hare Krishna. And someone was passing over water, Hare Krishna. And they were washing Hare Krishna. So, so the more we have the name, um, right there, easily on the tip of our tongue, then the more easily we can read, um, uh, sorry, remember at the time of death. So, um, 
So as, as we um, take Hare Krishna as our natural shelter, then when there's some drama in our lives, we'll natu naturally remember. And so at the time of death, um, we will be able to remember. So it's all up to us if we want to take another body. And it sounds like a silly thing to say, but actually um, by our present activities, we're actually forming our next body. Um, so if our, if our uh, present activities are concerned with the service of Krishna, um, hearing and chanting, um, serving the devotees, serving the Lord, then that the body that's being formed is going to be a spiritual body. But um, if we want to keep uh, our foot in two worlds, <laughs> then we can. Or if we want to stay here, then we can. But if we want to go to the spiritual world, then we can do that also. Prabhupada many times said, you can do it in one life. Others, they say, you can't do it in one life. But actually, um, Prabhupada said it many times, we can. It doesn't mean we will. It's up to us to have that desire for Krishna, for Krishna's lotus feet, for Krishna's holy name. And uh, Krishna can do the rest. If we've got that desire, then he reciprocates very nicely. So thank you very much. Um, I know there was a lot. Probably didn't cover a lot of it. <laughs> so many points. So if anyone has any questions or comments. Thank you, Abhika Prabhu, for the lovely class. Um, there's uh, just a couple of things. There's um, also a very nice verse in Bhagavatam where it describes that if you, that we pray to Krishna throughout our life that he will give us remembrance of him at the time of death. It's a nice verse. But I just wanted to uh, ask you, so um, Putana, she had that very unique result that she was actually, you know, taken to the spiritual world and she's there as Krishna's nursemaid. So with the other demons, then their uh, Shishupal, Kamsa, etc., they receive liberation, right? They merge into the body of Krishna. Is that or correct? Or into the effulgence, generally. Generally into the effulgence of Krishna. Into the Brahma Jyoti. Mm. And could you talk a little bit about Kamsa? Oh. <laughs> Kamsa, well, I forget who he was in his past life. Kamini, Kamini, Kamini. He was a demon killed by Vishnu. Uh -huh. Sorry? Kalamani. Yeah, Kalamani. Kalamani. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so then he, he, once he's killed, then he also merges into the Brahma yeah, the only, Jyoti? The only one that we hear mention of that got special treatment, which is why the Acharyas often pick this out, that Putana was given the opportunity to be the eternal maidservant because she offered that breast milk. But all the others, Kangsa included, we hear that they become liberated and then Prabhupada says, but you can't stay liberated forever, you know what I mean? Uh, you will come back because of that desire to perform activities, you'll come back. So uh, I'm, I don't know how long, you know, it's like eternal time. How do you know how long someone stays in, in that liberated state? But then they have to come back to the material world in the end to go to Vaikuntha to form that relationship with Krishna. Mm. Yeah. And Kamsa seems to be such, because he plays such a powerful role um, as, as a, you know, world-class demon, <laughs> murdering the children and, yeah. you know, causing so much, um, sending all, the, all of those other demons to uh, harass Krishna. Yeah. I, I was thinking the other day, and I, and I haven't read anything about this, but, you know, is it is that Jiva takes birth again as Kamsa and another one of Krishna's I don't know, because planets. we only hear about those, you know, Ravan and uh, Ravan and Kumbhakarna and uh, Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha and two that came in Krishna's time, get their names. Anyone inform me who they are? Those two demons. Anyway, um, Shishupal, Shishupal and Dantavakra. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we only hear about them. But you, mm. I, I, there are backstories for a lot of these demonic people, but uh, I don't know. Of course, you know, we, we, we want to focus more on the, the wonderful um, entities, personalities that appear in Krishna's earlier, but it's it just something that came up recently and I was quite, quite interested in yeah. uh, 
you know, what that role was. Yeah, I guess Thank in the you. Puranas, they've got lots of you know, stories in the Puranas about these yeah. things, but you know, unless they're mentioned by the Acharyas, most of the books that we read, you know, they don't talk about them so much. Okay, Shishirada Govadanadari Kijai. Yeah.